Hi, I'm Alex Butler, and welcome to our series, The Transformative Power of 5G. Thanks for joining us as we look at how Nokia is helping the 5G transformation with its new and open architectures. And joining us to discuss these exciting new innovations is Nokia's Mike Murphy, Chief Technology Officer for North America. Hi, Mike. Welcome to the program. Hi. Right, thank you, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you. So let's start first with what is the 5G transformation and what benefits will it bring for the future? So each generation of wireless improves on the previous generation, and typically in the areas of speed, the cost per gigabyte, and simplifying network architectures. And you could kind of say that going from 2G to 3G to 4G, those improvements were linear, they were incremental. But 5G is more of a discontinuity. It creates uh, greater change. It also does those linear improvements, but it introduces two new capabilities that didn't exist before, namely ultra low latency and extreme reliability. And what those two capabilities do is allows us to use 5G where we couldn't use it before in a wider variety of industries. For example, military applications, autonomous driving, healthcare, and industrial automation. So it's more pervasive from that perspective, and that's why it's more transformative. The CTIA forecast that 5G will generate about 4.5 million jobs in the U.S. and $1.5 trillion in economic benefit. That's more than 50% more than what it previously forecast. So things are looking really great for 5G as a transformative solution. Wow, that's great. Um, tell me, why is it important for Nokia to be a leader, though, in this sector? Well, changes like this only come about every 10 years. So I think it's critical for everybody in the telecommunications industry, providers and vendors alike, to be leading in 5G. And, you know, we tend to think of 5G as being focused just in mobility, but it also affects other businesses. In Nokia, we have mobility networks. We have a network infrastructure group that looks at optical and IP routing, and another business group that looks at cloud and uh, network systems. So 5G also affects those. So we need to lead in 5G, not only for mobile networks, but also for our other business groups. In addition, 5G has kind of become a tipping point for other changes. For example, virtualization of the whole network, including radio access networks, uh, development of open systems to support a, more, a broader ecosystem of vendors, and even web scale players are looking at taking part in 5G. So it's imperative for us to be at the forefront of all of these changes, else we'll be left behind. So what are the baseline requirements for 5G transformation and how is that different from what we have today? So we have great 4G networks in the US today and every month you can see improvements in speed and the cost per gigabyte. And those are focused on consumer mobility. That's the bread and butter of the industry. So 5G needs to do the same, and that's what's happening. We're introducing a seamless 5G overlay on top of our 4G networks to support consumer mobility. The next step is looking at those vertical industries I mentioned. And in some cases, changes are required to standards. There's maybe new devices required or changes to network architectures. So we see those coming a little bit later, maybe more towards 2023 or 2024. So that's the time you see first support of consumer mobility and then moving to the vertical industry side. Will that baseline help bridge then the digital divide? That's a great question. 5G brings with it a few more tools to the toolkit that we can apply to solving this problem. For example, there's support of low, mid and high band spectrum and combined those are great options to uh, reducing the digital divide and supporting urban and rural applications. And some of the archi architectures being considered centralized and distributed solution will also support remote or rural communities. I think the best way to look at this is give an example. So let's say today you wanted 100 megabit per service uh, to your home in a rural community. The only way to do that at the moment would be to dig trenches into the street to your home and put in a fiber network solution. That's kind of costly and a little bit slow. In 5G, we can look at putting a tower, uh, putting an antenna on a pole or a tower, radiating a few miles and covering an entire village with near gigabit speeds. So we have the tools in the toolkit to reduce the digital divide. Now it's just a matter of applying them. And how is Nokia contributing towards evolving the 5G ecosystem to support the transformation? The foundation of 5G is standards. 
And Nokia has the largest 5G essential patent portfolio in the industry. And with that knowledge base, we can apply it to our product development activities and also looking at uh, use cases. So, for example, we developed over 100 business cases for different applications. In addition, you remember those tipping points I mentioned before. Nokia is at the forefront of driving some of those. So in the ORAN alliance, we're leading the specifications for the most important interfaces. And just a couple of weeks ago, we announced partnerships with all of the top three web scale players to look at deploying our virtualized and containerized network solutions on their platforms. Then we're taking all of that and applying it to our 200 5G commercial contracts with customers and our 260 contracts with privacy for private wireless networks. What would you say we're missing in the US in order to capitalize, let's say, on 5G transformation? The FCC has done some great work in the past and continues to do so. So a little over a couple of years ago, they implemented what's called the siting order to reduce the cost for deploying sites on, uh, on, on towers or, or whatever location and reducing the permitting time to get approval for those sites. So that was fantastic. Then there was over five gigahertz of millimeter wave spectrum that was auctioned off. This is by far, by far the most of any country in the world. And there was a bit of a gap in mid-band spectrum or C-band spectrum, but with the auction that just recently closed, now that gap is closed in comparison to other countries. And it also creates a more level playing field among the different providers in the U.S. So we have those good baselines. Now the next step for those vertical industry applications, there's a few industry associations that look at uh, defining what are the requirements into standards bodies. One is GATMA for aerial or drone type solutions. Another is 5GAA for the automotive industry. And the third is 5G ACIA for industrial applications. So the U.S. has good membership on those, but it's not necessarily in a leading position with respect to membership or contribution. So that's perhaps an area that could do a little bit more work, including with perhaps some federal support. Now, 5G, some have called it a, a race, it was the race to 5G, but there's an even bigger race coming up, which is 6G. And in moving towards 6G, there's a little more nationalism uh, exhibited by countries, meaning support for indigenous suppliers. So the U.S. also needs to be at the forefront there, and the federal government can help here in, help, in uh, supporting the launch of research activities in universities or with vendors. Well, Mike, that's a lot of really great information. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today, and I hope you'll all join us next time for our series, The Transformative Power of 5G.